Hello and welcome to Myth Makers. Myth Makers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm the director of the centre, but also an author. And today I'm doing one of my favourite things to do on this podcast is I'm meeting another author new to me, and that is Hele Norup. Now, Hele, have I got that right? That's fine. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I think and fine. Thank you so sounds, much for having me. <laughs> fine sounds like I've got it slightly wrong. Hele. Hele, I think you said when we... Uh, so, Hele, perhaps um, we could start by finding out where you're from, because uh, I think you are actually not sitting in the UK as I speak to you. No, I'm in Switzerland. Um, uh, I'm originally from Denmark and I lived there until I was 18. And since then, I've been kind of moving around living in the UK, living in the US, in Switzerland, in Austria, in Singapore, and a couple of times back to Switzerland. And, and that's where I am now as well. Ah, oh, we must yeah. have a, a talk about how all that travel has influenced what you do. But first of all, Heli, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey to being an author? Um, and perhaps as you tell the story, you might want to say what kind of fantasy books you were reading along the way. Yes. So, well, I would say I have had, have had a very roundabout way of becoming an author. Um, I was always a voracious reader from when I was very little. Fairy tales were really important. I read so many Hunters and Addison, of course, but also Grimm's Tales, which I love. Um, and I was very much a daydreamer, um, but I was not a writer. I didn't enjoy writing in school, to be honest. And I had no idea becoming an author was an actual possibility. I think we didn't have author visits. I, I had never seen an author. I, they, they didn't seem to be real people to me. So it was just not something I considered at all, even though, I mean, I really escaped into books my my whole life, I think. Um, and uh, so I studied economics, business management, and I had a career in, in kind of corporate pharmaceutical marketing strategy and things like that. Moved a little bit along the way towards more communication and, and so on, and started writing in my 30s again. Uh, and I think one of the things that made me start writing was that I began to read children's books again. I had had a period I, I was always a fantasy reader, but I had a period where I certainly wasn't reading children's books. And then I think when uh, His Dark Materials came out, they kind of sparked my imagination in a new way. And I really wanted to try to write as well. And I began several, several books that never got beyond, let's say, three, four chapters or something. Mm. Then I gave up. A year would pass, I would start something new. And, and it wasn't until maybe 10, 12 years ago that I finished a project. I finished a first draft of something. Uh, and then I spent four or five years learning to write and rewriting that and having like an editorial uh, feedback from a consultancy and so on and kind of working on my craft and learning learning how to write and become a writer. And um and I queried that manuscript and it got some interest. And um, then I was lucky enough to meet uh, Sarah Odedina, who's my editor at Pushkin, um, at a conference in Singapore. And she read this, this uh, first novel and she liked my writing, but didn't kind of like the story. But she gave me a very, very kind and encouraging rejection and asked me to send uh, the next thing I wrote. And, and that was then the first book that uh, I had published, The, the Missing Barbagasi, which is about alpine elves. So, so um, what I love about the way you described all that is how positive you were in, the, in your response to rejection, which is a part of an author's life. Not everything you write will be accepted and the same book can be rejected by, you know, 20 publishers before one person takes it on. And you phrase that as a very, po as a positive experience. And I suppose that uh, is. Uh... I, I don't think it was always positive. When you, okay. when, when you get a rejection letter, it's not positive. But I think for me, I mean, I had 
studied at university for five years and I knew I had worked for a couple of years in, in the company where I was working until I was really good at what I was doing. So when I started taking my writing seriously, and, and I think that was around 2010, I said to myself, okay, seven years. I mean, I, I will give this seven years. I will do everything I can. And I know I'm not going to be picked up by anyone in the first couple of years because I need to learn this. This is a craft as well as something inspired and, 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 and creative, but I need to learn the craft first. And I always had this long-term perspective, I think. And, and, and that helped me when kind of like after four years when I started querying and, and I got rejected that I could say to myself, well, I'm, I'm just not there yet. I need to work some more on this. And uh, the choice of seven years does feel like you've been influenced by your fairy tales because a seven year maybe. time it sounds like something a hero would do. I'm going to do seven years of traveling. Yeah. On the quest. Excellent. Yes. Um, so you mentioned his dark materials as part of what reignited your imagination in your 30s. But what were you reading as a, a younger person in your sort of childhood and teen years that inspired you? Yes. So I think, I mean, one of the uh, very clear inspirations for me was uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, which mm. I read. I don't even know when I read it, but um, the animated film, the old animated film was always shown in Denmark on Boxing Day. And I watched that. This was like my highlight of, of, of kind of Christmas to watch that uh, film. And I just loved it. And read it later on and read all the Narnia books later on. So, so um, that, that was really one of my early favorites. And then Astrid Lindgren's books, which I think being from Denmark, I probably read earlier than, than many yeah. other people. And especially her book, uh, The Brothers Lenhardt, um, which not many people in the UK know. It is, it is translated. Um, but it's this uh, fantasy story about uh, two brothers. Um, the younger one is ill. The older one is like a real hero. Uh, and he saves his younger brother and dies in like the first chapter. And then the younger brother dies as well. And they meet in this afterworld life, which is not all that it seems. It's not kind of a rosy afterlife, but there are dragons and evil Kind of an evil ruler there and 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 it's this absolute magical world that they come to through death so an afterlife fantasy um and i got that book for my ninth birthday and i don't know how many times i read it i, I that was another absolute favorite um it's funny the never you said being... story as, oh, oh yes sorry. michael end the, just going back to what you were saying about lion and the witch in the wardrobe brought back a memory to me about it is one of the first books that I heard somebody else talk about with excitement because where I yeah. lived in a sort of suburban part of London uh, in our back garden, we had a fence along the middle and I must have been very small at the time. But I remember the little girl next door who was old enough to be our babysitter talking to me through the fence about this amazing story she had read. It had a witch, a white witch and a and a lion and you went through a wardrobe I just remember how excited she was about it telling me way before I could have read oh, it wow. about it it's like a secret and that's what's so wonderful about finding a book you love is it becomes your secret doesn't it that you can share with other people did you know how good this book was and try this as though you're passing on a, a kind of a magical power almost uh, that's what I love about um, those sorts of reads when you're a child which really uh, sort of take over so the the one you were talking about the Astrid Lundgren book was that the brothers what was the second part of that the brothers Lionheart the yeah. brothers Lionheart there we are so everybody that's yes. one to look up um yeah and, and it was follow. very controversial actually it came out I think in the I don't know when it came out early 70s or something and it was even discussed in the Swedish parliament they considered banning it because it they thought it promoted suicide because it was this fantasy world beyond life uh so it's quite an interesting book as well from us more 
scholarly perspective perhaps okay so obviously yeah. read read with that knowledge uh, in advance but yes yeah so um the book that i've read of yours um uh, which is your latest book is called into the fairy he- hill um which for those who watch look at this on youtube you can see the lovely cover here would you like to sort of give us your uh, little plot summary so people know the kind of book and the kind of audience you're expecting for this story Yes, yeah, so it's a middle grade novel, so for nine to 12 year olds. And uh, it's the story of a 12 year old boy called Alfred. Um, he's very, he's root, uh, rootless and uh, he doesn't feel he belongs anywhere in the world. And partly that because he's been moving around his whole life, uh, following his dad, where his dad has been working. And the story starts when he comes to stay at his uh, grandmother's cottage which is in this very rural location, right on the edge of something that's called the fairy hill. Uh, and, and early on when he's there, he discovers these vicious uh, creatures that are terrorizing his uh, grandmother and kind of ruining her flowers and her yarn and, and, and things. And he's quite overwhelmed with these, uh, the strangeness and also the nature because he's mainly been living in cities. And, and then he meets uh, Saga and... Um, it's a neighboring uh, a, a girl, a 12 year old girl as well. Uh, and uh, she's an activist and kind of an eco warrior. And, and um, she has this tree sprite companion that follows her around. Um, and uh, she sweeps him up in this quest she has to stop um, the local or protect the local nature from, uh, from a motorway tunnel that's planned uh, through this fairy hill. And uh, Alfred's father is actually the project manager kind of on, on, on this uh, project. So, so uh, there's a conflict, clear conflict there. But the fairies are also very much against this uh, project and they have their own way of, of dealing with people who disturb their peace. And, and so as Alfred and Saga are fighting against the the motorway tunnel, they are drawn ever closer to this fairy world and the fairy creature. And Alfred begins to uncover some secrets about his own heritage and, and solve some mysteries that are uh, around his own family. And uh, and it's very much a story about, I would say, family and friendship and finding out where you belong and, and, and maybe being proud of who you actually are, uh, accepting all the parts of yourself, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, I'm very drawn to some of the subject matter that you've used as well, because I my first um, children's fantasy series was called The Companions Quartet, where I dramatized a sort of environmental clash um, as part of the story. Well, it was the it was the story. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, you know, clearly digging in a fairy hill is not going to go well. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you can see. Um, so the actual place isn't specified is it but you have a very strong sense of topography you know like where things are in relation to each each other do you have um secretly in your mind a real place or is it just existing as a sort of exemplar world for you to do your story in what what's going on there you've got a lovely it's map it's kind of a mix i would say it's a mix of different places um that I've been and places that I've imagined. So it's it's not an entirely real place. Yeah. And and this is a very lovely map compared to like the first map that I drew of the place. <laughs> but um, oh, well, that's nice when you get I'm a publisher glad we have and they illustrators. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> let's not let's give a shout out for illustrators. Uh yes. But there's obviously the um the fairy law, uh, which comes mm. from many nations um differently expressed did did you have one which was your sort of home fairy law that you were following like in Ireland or uh, Shakespeare or something or were you uh, something from Hans Christian Andersen or is it an amalgam of all those different things uh, it is really an amalgam I'm I'm a magpie and I have stolen from British Isles fairy law from Scandinavian fairy law from German fairy law from Shakespeare, yes, and and even from Tolkien and and other authors as well. It's it's very much kind of taking everything that I love about fairies uh, 
and 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 taking that. I even had a YouTube video of someone in Scotland who had who claims to have had his shadow stolen by little people that uh, inspired part of this, uh, as, as you will know, uh, after reading it. So, yeah. so well, I've that's in, really that's in, stolen from everywhere. That's interesting, because I thought that that part about that shadow stealing might have come from Peter Pan, because, of course, yeah, there's the... No, 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 no okay, because, you know, there's a bit where it, uh, he comes to get it. It's in the... It's been rolled up and put in a drawer somewhere. Um, which was his quirky yes. idea oh well that's so interesting that um uh that actually that I was assuming a source and and it had come from from someone's real con the conception of their real experience hmm. yes what about yeah. how you actually get down to writing you've got all these ideas and you've watched your youtube videos and you've read your fairy tales and all the rest of it and you've got your sketch map what then happens are you uh planner or do you feel your way through the story i i very much feel my way through the story i would say i mean i i think some stories they uh, need time to steep and and this one has really been percolating in my mind for a long time i think from all of these different fairies and and fairy lore and and of course i have read different books also before writing it uh, from like catherine bricks and diane perkis have written really excellent books about fairies um but i first uh, i was in a writing workshop in 2016 uh, that I attended and there was this character workshop and we had to enter character and in that workshop I invented this water sprite um, who longed to see the ocean and who lived in the mountains somewhere and I later I wrote actually as a, a story about this water sprite for a children's magazine but I always knew I wanted to explore uh, this kind of these different types of sprites and elves and fairies and 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 have a story where where they work together and it took some time before I found the right one, um, but other than that I will start with kind of having a character and a setting and a first line that is really what I definitely need. I also always know the ending of a story and I like to know a couple of maybe major points in the in the middle of the book it's not so much in terms of actual plot I would say I'm very much uh when I'm when I'm planning most of my planning goes into planning the character and 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 looking at the character how the character will develop and then finding out what are the events that will force the character to develop in in this direction uh, and 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 make sure that uh, that they change uh, throughout the story um, so a lot of work on the character and I also do a lot of work on the setting and uh, so my first two books were actually set in real places one in a in a real village in the in the Alps and the other uh, in the middle of Singapore um, so so very real places but with the first one with some fantastical elements in the real world and the second one also with a portal to to a kind of a fantasy realm. Um, and uh, I I really need to go to get to know these places. So for those, it was kind of easy. Look at real maps, go go around, take photos of real places and 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 kind of know the roots of the of the characters. And for this one, I did a lot of forest walks and it was I, I wrote most of it during the pandemic, so I could only walk in the forest. Uh, uh, yeah, um, that was quite helpful to write a kind of a nature novel uh, mm. uh, at that time. Uh, and I I am a hobby photographer, so I take a lot of photos and I have a lot of photos of places I've traveled to, other forests I've traveled to, limestone caverns and underground places and, and everything. So I always take a lot of photos and I use a lot of photos when I'm writing and to to as kind of springboards for for the set that I'm uh, uh, imagining yeah so um, and other than that yeah so you don't have the experience of your publisher saying uh we need a breakdown of the book before you've written it because I've had that a couple of times recently and I'm actually more of a feel my way through to a story person but I've had to write 
basically write the novel before I write it, um, <laughs> which is... I have written kind of outlines, but they don't exactly follow the outlines, I would say. I don't think they look I, them I, up I, again. I think they, they, they... No, I don't think they I do, think actually. They're, they're ticking a box, so yes, she knows what she's doing, but... Yeah, a famous last words. I'm about to hand one in where I've deviated slightly, and well, you know, it, I just had to because that's the way the story went when I was writing it. That, yeah, I think it 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 frees the imagination up to there's things that suddenly happen when you're writing that 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 is unplanned. Yeah. Um and I think sometimes those are the best bits. But the only thing I will say to this kind of this kind of way of writing is that there's usually quite a lot for me to do in the second draft because that's about finding the shape of the story and finding out what actually belongs in the story yeah. and, and 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 what needs to be scrapped so so i think the second draft for me i i really love revising and 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 kind of finding the way through this whole kind of mess that that the first draft is um once i have an idea how i'm going to get through it but but I like seeing the improvements and, and how the story takes shape. Uh, but there is a lot of work. And, and some of my books have really taken a lot of work and a lot of rewriting. Um, but, but I feel that I need the material that a first draft that's more loosely based that, 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 that generates. And it also enables me to create layers in the story and, and, and kind of take from different parts of, of what I have spurged onto the page and 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 make that uh more of a tapestry um than than a straightforward uh kind of narrative. Yeah. It's one of the things we do on our courses. We uh, we do um courses that either you can take a, a novel through a year with some tutors or a, a six week intensive course. Uh, and I always make sure we have tutors who are on both sides of this there are those who plan and those who don't because different different creative types need different sorts of um input but the the lady who is the most planning orientated she always says well I don't have to sit and undo it as much as you do you know once once I've done my plan and spent the months on that then I just write it whereas for me I just couldn't do it that way I think I'd feel as though it was I bit dead somehow the writing was already done in somewhere so I have to be yeah. much more do the sketch first and then fill it out you know much more like you do um but yeah everybody finds their way you know you try a different everybody tactic another different. time and you know it helps with problems yeah. if you think well I need to do a bit of planning now you know those things do actually knowing that it's not the only way of doing it I think really helps too so when I was reading, I think book... so, but 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 I like this kind of. I like to have a couple of lighthouses in that I can aim for when I'm when I'm writing, and and it's interesting. I've always kind of ended up with the ending that I had mm. thought I would I would want. So even though I, sometimes I might change the route that I got there quite quite a lot in the second draft, it's uh, I always get towards the the end point that I had in mind. Yes, I like the idea of it being called a lighthouse. That's that's a new mm. new version of this. That's a very nice image. So when I was reading your book, I was thinking of um, things that which were felt in this area of using a children's adventure in a kind of traditional fairy landscape. And it made me think of the wonderful books that were around when I was growing up, The Dark is Rising, um series by Susan Cooper and Alan Garner who of course is still writing and has just been um he was shortlisted for the Booker Prize this year but his The Owl Service and The Weirstone of Brisingerman those books um if someone is thinking well what's Helly's book like I think it, it's a sort of slightly younger version of those in that I felt your characters were a year or two younger uh in terms of their way they relate to each other and so perhaps those books are edi edging into YA fiction upper end of middle grade and yours are firmly in the middle grade were you aware of these other books or is that just something that 
um you know you came up came to yourself spontaneously I mean I I never read Alan Garner or Susan Cooper oh, you got a I treat. don't even know if they were translated but I have read quite a few of their books I mean I've read Susan Cooper's whole sequence mm. and uh, I I really love uh, the, uh, the Dark is Rising and and some of the other books as well and I've read uh, the Owl Service and, and all of Alan Garner's newest book and uh, mm. I think a few others but but only after I started writing myself so I wouldn't say something that I'm aware of, but it's interesting. My the Hungry Ghost, uh, so my previous book, although it takes place in Singapore and tropical heat, uh, one reviewer uh, compared it to the The Dark Is Rising and and found some similarities be between those two books. So, so it can very well be that I'm a little bit in 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 that direction, and and I I don't mind that at all. No, it's it's good will company compare to my keep. books to those books. Yes. I think the difference I would say is that those books um, have a very specific location. Um, so that's maybe yes. why the Singapore based book um, made that connection um, using some kind of local legend, which is then explored in, in a, uh, in a child's adventure. I mean, I'm also thinking there yes. are sort of the John Maysfield books from earlier, things like the box of delight. It's definitely, I, I'm not yeah. sure what people there must be a name for this genre and i'm not sure what it is um folkloric fantasy maybe <laughs> it's got that feel to it and yeah, because it's yes. not it's not a fairy tale and you spell fairy uh f-a-e-r-i-e -E to differentiate it from kind of the disney-fied sweet cute yes fairy yes and that's really important so that leads me to my next question which is the role of fairies in fantasy and the question I put down here is do they need a makeover well you've sort of done your own makeover and I think um fantasy has a lot of fantasy is pushing against the the kind of fairy flower fairy version of this but tell me how yes. you think about um the world of the fairy the world of the fae I, I'm definitely most attracted to the fairies that are tricksy and fearsome and spiteful and, and, and kind of interesting. And also this kind of wide, because I, I categorize all of the creatures in my yeah. book as, as fairies. And that's kind of from the, um, from the do you, I don't know if you know, the Brian Fraud and, and Alan Lee book of fairies. Oh, wonderful. And it's kind of there. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. It has the most beautiful illustrations uh, uh i don't know if you can see them no like this yes. it has everywhere like, these illustration of fairies and so on of course and, alan lee and they is, categorize as i was going to say alan lee is the same alan lee as did the concept art for the peter jackson films which a lot of our listeners will um as tolkien fans will be well aware of we must put a link to that book in the show notes so people can find it yes and actually my my first version of the lord of the rings has his illustrations as well mm. uh, it's illustrated by Alan Lee. Yeah. so that so that so, particular book amalgamates all of these categories of sprites and brownies and uh and fairies and, fairies. and, and, and back to your question I, th I think it is getting, uh, fairies are getting a makeover in, in middle grade. And there's been some wonderful books published in recent years. I would say Michelle Harrison's uh, 13 Treasures mm. series. I think it was published maybe 10 years ago, the first book, something like that, has but very tricksy fairies. Um, and uh, there's been like Other Land by Louis Stowell and... Uh, the Chime Seekers by uh, Ross Montgomery have been, they were published while I was editing and, and both have also kind of these vicious fairies and also influences from German fairy lore and, and, and so on. So, um, so, yeah, so yeah. there is a makeover. And I think in YA, there has been a, yeah. a longer period of, of kind of darker fairies uh, yeah, it's when well. we say a makeover, really, it's a going back, isn't it? Because I think yes. that the the sweet and cute, pretty fairy um, was a, something that came up during the Victorian period, really, with particularly with 
illustrations for stories and what they thought children yes. should be exposed to. But and these flower fairies, there were a lot of, I think, books yes, with flower I, fairies. Yeah, no, they, they so were, yeah. I had those when I was little. They, they are wonderful ways of teaching you, um, well, about flowers and trees. And there's a little poem and a picture of a flower fairy um, describing what a daisy's like, what a daffodil's like, and so on. I can conjure up the pictures as I'm saying it here to you. So it served a purpose as a educational tool for noticing what's in the garden and on, on your woodland walks um but these older version of the the wicked dangerous scary fairies are what has been in the older fairy stories and of course you just have to think of someone like puck in mm. a you know, that is yes. that kind of fairy the one yes. who curdles the milk and mixes up the juice that you put in the eyes of lovers you know it's they're the ones I suppose yeah. they were thought of as a way of explaining why things went wrong at home so it wasn't my fault <laughs> no I think they've always kind of been used to explain different things in nature particularly mm. and uh, and in, in Denmark we have these kind of little Christmas elves that are also quite tricksy unless you give them the 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 porridge for Christmas or whatever they need and so on. So they can also create, uh, uh, be mischievous and, 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 and create problems in the homes and so on. So I think there are, but other than that, you are right. We need to go back and back to the original, many of the original stories about fairies were uh, a lot darker. Like the fairy tales were much darker. Yeah. Grimm's tales were much darker than the Disney versions have been. It's, and also, of course, you mentioned Tolkien in passing, but uh, his elves are an attempt to completely rewrite elves mm. um, back to the other, the more like fae, the kind of people who rode out of the fairy hills and changed the world and took people off for captivity for seven years. These were not, these were not kind and gentle creatures in the landscape, though he was trying to make his more... Um, invent a whole kind of new elf of a sort of an original people kind of idea yes um but he's he was doing a similar job as you and other writers are doing to the smaller fairies shall we say the sprites that level of <laughs> in our in our height in our height lineup. yes <laughs> yeah yes yes <laughs> so um we, we've touched briefly already on the importance of maps for your world building um, but you also seem to have visited places which in so you may have visited a particular street in Singapore or a, a particular glade in a forest that you used to locate your story. So when you're doing that, do you literally go with a, a pen and paper and take notes or is it thinking back from your couch um, like Wordsworth I does? <laughs> no, I will. I will. Um, when I was walking here during during the lockdown period i i would speak notes into my phone about what i could hear what i could kind of smell and and and, and sense and in addition to taking photos and and i've done that quite a lot other uh, for my other books as well kind of getting all of the senses into into the setting uh which i think is is really important uh but i am very visual so i'm very I think, and, and, and that's why I use photos a lot and maps a lot and, and, and so on. But I'm aware that I'm visual, so I need to bring in all the other senses as well. Uh, that's yeah. a really good point because um, we do tend to, in, in description, people tend to start with what they see. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that And that is, obviously doesn't speak to everybody because not everybody is sighted, but also when you actually think of your reaction to a place, the, the the way you interact with it may be something else, like how cold it is, how warm it is, mm. what the humidity is like, um, how loud the noises are, how quiet it is. And it, so you're right. One of the top tips for writing is to step out of, close your eyes in that world for a bit um, and see what, then see what happens. Yes. Yes. No. And I, I think that all the world builders that are amazing at kind of doing that, they they take this full rounded view of of, of the worlds and the mm. landscape and and 
And I think I also like this. I mean, Tolkien is, of course, the ultimate world builder, I would say. Um, no one is, is is better than him and, and, and more detailed than him. And, and it's so amazing this, how, how big a world he has created. And uh, my worlds are so much smaller, but I like to have this sense of the landscape that it's more expansive than what's, what I actually put in the book, that the reader get a feeling that, that there's a lot more um, to be explored um, if they were to enter this world. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> so one of the things I noticed um, reading your book is how you have places, I've called them liminal, and we were talking before we started recording about what I meant by that. So there are spaces in your landscape which belong both to fairy and to the, I don't know, not the real world, our world. Um, do you feel, I mean, I think in a way a book is like that. A book is a space which when you're sitting reading it, you are in our ordinary world, but also your brain is somewhere else. It's gone somewhere else. So I was thinking about the power of those liminal spaces. Do you find yourself drawn to writing about the places that are changeable and, and can be one or other you mentioned that you've written a portal fantasy that seems like you know absolutely in this way because a, a door is the thing yes which... and I would say this is also a kind of the into the mm. fairy hill is also a portal fantasy and I've always been drawn to these books that are set in the kind of borderlands between what's real and 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 fantastical I think like like for instance the line the witch in the wardrobe this thing that there can be a wardrobe that you could open and you could enter another world is is just has just always been the most amazing thing and I you're right books are like that and um I wanted to mention another book that I love growing up and that's a never-ending story mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read it but that yeah. is actually that you go through the book the reader of the book becomes the character in 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 the story and um and I think that has been a huge inspiration as well, because there is, especially with these liminal spaces, that there is an influence from one world to the other, that that they can, there's a cause and effect perhaps between between the real world and the fantastical and, and maybe even the other way around as well. I think that is really interesting uh, to explore and, 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 uh, in uh into the fairy hill with the kind of part of the climate as aspect of it is also that when we in the real world destroy nature that kind of also destroys part of the fairy world so that 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 is a cause and effect uh, that happens um uh between the worlds um but i'm very drawn to to all stories that kind of open from the real world and 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 into another world and and it is interesting to write that and it's but I would say one of the challenges is then also to invent and create these liminal spaces mm. and create the portal from one place to another in something that feels new and and feels a little bit fresh because there are of course a lot of tropes in in in, in this area um so, I think it's um, also about what we do when we play um particularly mm -hmm. as children in make-believe play so uh, you give a child a, a box of dressing up clothes and go away and when you come back they're in a throne room um yeah. or they're in outer space they say right you know this place here is now also this yeah. I remember watching um we went on a family holiday to a sort of very basic uh, little house in Tuscany so there wasn't much there was no play toys but we had sort of lots of small children with us and initially the children were sort of saying oh you know I'm bored you know that that thing and then left alone they organized themselves into taking all the sort of broken bits of um, garden furniture to build a rocket and off they went on their adventures in the mines it was a bit like watching them turn into 
Eni Blight and Children, you know, going yeah. off up the hill <laughs> on adventures with the oldest one leading the way and the youngest one, you know, being looked after at the back. And I was thinking, yes, that we have this natural instinct, don't we, particularly when we're in the outdoors, um, to look at a space and think, what else can this be? Who else could live here, be it a historical idea back in time or a fantasy idea? So bring in magic. So I think what we're doing as writers, in a way, is just an adult form of play, putting it down in words. Yeah, completely. <laughs> we're just <Yeah>. children. <laughs> we're just children. <laughs> so another thing, um, sort of the last question I had for you about the Fairy Hill is about Alfred, um, the main character who's a very relatable child for a number of reasons, one of which he has a something which is seen as a sort of mi mild disability, um, something which he feels has set him apart. Um, but also he has a sort of superpower as well, mm. so it goes along with this. Um, but underlying all this is his sense of not knowing who he is, not knowing who his identity is, even to the point of questioning, are his parents his parents? You know, that kind of thing. Um, so I was wanting to ask you, Heli, about the role of fiction in helping children frame these questions, which I think almost everybody has that thought, you know, am I, is this really my parents or am I, you know, the, the things that you thought you think through, if you're unlike your brothers and sisters, you know, how do we all fit together? Um, is that what's going on with him using fantasy as a frame to look at this? I, yeah, I think so. And I think fiction and um especially middle grade fiction mm. is very much about characters finding out who they are and where they belong. I think uh, at that age, um, kids, are just, they're just on the cusp of becoming teenagers. They are in this transition period from kind of depending entirely on their families and, and being in the family group to becoming far, part of friends group and, and friends becoming more and more important to them. And, uh, and, and, and at the same time, they have this growing independence, I would say. Mm. Um, so, so I think it's a period where it's difficult to balance everything and, and, and find out wh where do I belong? Where do I belong in my family? Where do I belong among my friends? Uh, who am I? And so on. And, and, I think for kids seeing characters in fiction who struggle with these things is, is really helpful and, and gives them a perspective and, and, and ultimately can also make them feel better about who, who they are. I hope so. I, I think they will. I think that yeah. was, uh, I, I won't spoil the, uh, the twist, um, but just that that is one of the big mysteries in it, which is, has a satisfactory conclusion, shall we say. Uh, thank you, Heli. We have a recurring segment in our podcast. There are two things we do. One is we decide where is the best place in all the fantasy worlds for something and also a tip, a fantasy tip. So thinking about what would be the appropriate location or, or thing to ask you about, one of the um, key locations in Fairy Hill is a limestone cavern. And that got me thinking about caves uh, and their presence in fantasy stories. So mm. I wanted you to say where in all the fantasy books that you've read or watched as a film, it doesn't matter if it's a screen version of this, where would you think it'd be best place to be a caver, to go caving? Well, I think I wouldn't actually want to be a caver. <laughs> I'm <laughs> very fascinated, but also a little bit scared of being underground. And I think when we look at fi uh, fantasy fiction, uh, there's seldom anything good on the ground. It's it's often kind kind of scary places. But um, I I I think I would go to Tolkien uh, if I were a caver, and I would probably go to the Lonely Mountain, go into the Lonely Mountain and see Erebor. Hopefully, when Smaug is not there, um, or maybe visit like Moria, but not when the fellowship yeah. is there, but before, before. long before yeah. when it was at the height of its glory days. Um, There's also the caves at Helm's Deep that um, Gimli discovers during yes. the battle, which he, it's one of those times where Tolkien stops stops for a big, wonderful description 
of the caves as seen by Gimli. Yes. And he manages to twist Legolas's arm, says that, you know, I'll come I'll come to Fangorn with you if you come to the caves with me. Um yeah. So no, I think I agree, but as you've picked that, I'm gonna to have to come up with someone somewhere else. Um well, I suppose pirate caves is one place mm. where you do get uh, the, the concept of sort of, you know, caves of treasure. So we were talking about Peter Pan earlier, but there's a great pirate cave there with the, the face that looks like a skull. Yes. In. So that would be a fun one to visit. Not very safe, but then I suppose, as you said, <laughs> um, caves don't tend to be safe. No, they don't. But I ha and I have actually I have been to New Zealand when we lived in Singapore and I have visited Hobbiton, but also visited the these white or glowworm caves that that have inspired uh, the setting in my book and that is actually where they recorded a lot of the sound for the film so for the underground setting uh, in, in ah. uh, at least in the Hobbit movies I'm not sure if they did already with the the Lord of the Rings movies, but. They are absolutely magical caves and there's an underground river and you have all of these glowworms hanging down from the ceiling and lighting everything up. It's it's a really beautiful place. Yeah. Delightful. Uh, absolutely delightful. Yeah. Lovely little bit of trivia for us all. And so finally, would you like to give us a, a fantasy tip? Something that you'd like to recommend to our listenership? Uh, well, if it would be a writing tip. You, you can do either... You can yeah. you can define that as you like. Hmm. Um, I would say for kind of for writing fantasy, it's I we touched on this earlier, but to make the setting and the world as believable as possible, um, uh, I, it's about bringing all the senses in, bringing bringing kind of familiar scents and 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 sounds and sights and so on into this fantastical so it can be anchored at something in something the reader already knows and 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 the same i would say for characters or fantasy characters um bring in familiar uh motivations and characteristics that uh the readers and for me that that's child readers uh, that 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 they know themselves and kind of bring bring the characters to life for them in in giving them uh something that the the reader understands um uh, that i think is is really key uh to to to, to placing it and and I, I would also say in the kind of books that i write that are set both in the kind of a real world setting and enter fantasy setting it's just extremely important that the reader can't find fault with the real world it has to be really really real uh and if there are historical elements they they have to be as real as possible because as soon as the real reader finds something that doesn't make sense there it automatically makes the fantasy part less believable as well um so so that i would say anchor kind of the real world in a in a very real place so i would say my tip is mm -hmm. about reading sideways so if you're writing a book like yours say set in um folkloric fantasy world i would probably avoid reading other people who are writing in that same area whilst i'm writing it because i'm, I'm worried about interference on my antennae um yes but it's really really good to read sideways so think of like you had that book of um that non-fiction well non-fiction you know what I mean uh, an encyclopedia of fairies something like that which is or a collection of ballads or um, a history book and have your research eyes open because I get loads of ideas whilst I'm writing from the things I'm reading adjacent to my project and it keeps it fresh and often if you've got a problem a plot problem you'll find the answer by something else you're reading in a completely different area so that's that's my tip carry on reading but go mm. a bit sideways from the project you're actually working on yeah, yeah. So thank you so to. much, uh, Hele, for joining us. And we wish you all the best for the publication. Well, it's, is it out now? In 
No, 2nd of March. So. Oh, so very soon. Um, yeah. I've got, oh, it's an uncorrected bound proof. So my, I think mine is quite like the, the finished item, but it's a, a fantastic book. And you've also, as you mentioned, have written two other um, fantasy books already, The Missing Barber Gazi. And what was yes. the one in um, Singapore? The Hungry Ghost. The Hungry, the Hungry Ghost. Ghost. Yeah. So, yes, uh, it sounds a wonderfully um, diverse collection of stories that you're building up. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.